those those in the command of those who guard such VIP officers to ensure that they also assist in ensuring that the law and order is maintained. We hope that this situation will improve, but I can hear the concern that the honourable members have and will continue to work. Uh, is there a law on the number of deployment? There is no law. I'll be very happy if you enacted one. Maybe if you actually enacted one and said for every holder of an office, uh, you'll be entitled up to X. It will be very happy. I mean, we will all be very happy, and I'm sure that the gentleman to my left will be very happy because it will make the work much easier uh, as it were. But now, as it is, I, I give you this example, Mr. Chairman. If today, for example, the holder of that office uh, requested that uh, I have uh, a bujari in Rongai, and I need the bujari to be guarded, and you refused to guard the bujari, then the bujari was attacked tomorrow. I mean, if we are insulted now, look at how we are being excoriated for just a routine reorganization of security. Can you imagine what would happen to us if that happened? So when a request comes, we accede to it. And then, then, then we, we, we keep moving forward. And all these wonderful men in the police service are doing so in good faith. And, and the question here then was, up to what extent will you keep on acceding to requests? Up, up to which number will you then stop? Because uh, uh, as much as you're answering the others, you, you will now open. Uh, this this line for us to be able to ask for extra police officers or security officers for that matter. Well, uh, please enact a law. Let, let, I, think, let, I think let's end the debate there. If you enacted a law that brought about limits, that brought about um, talked about numbers, uh, and then 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 we can be able to uh, solve that problem once and for all. The letter from the chief of staff that was written to the IG and to the Inspector General, I mean to the Head of Public Service, and copied to our peers, Dr. Kibicho. You know, the letter said about these things are better, uh, to be very honest with you, because of one thing. Uh, you can notice how, in some cases, Mr. Chairman, to be very frank with you, we are, if we are not careful as a country, we are sinking to new laws. Where you would, where in this world, just tell me, Mr. Chairman, where in this world would a holder of an office of chief of staff in a senior office like that write a letter and put it in social media before it even reaches the Inspector General of Police? Where? And then so on. You know, this issue has been characterized by some very juvenile activism, petty propagandism, and so on. And then the facts are lost in that process, and then we don't want, we, because we are respectful of the institutions that we work, we don't want to go that direction. And we are not going to respond to those kinds of antics. We will do the work that we have been asked to do. That's why you have noticed that there hasn't been any correspondence from any one of us, including our Inspector General of Police. Because there are some institutions, if you subject them to disrepute, you erode the institutional respectability of your country, as it were, you end up vulgarizing the authority and legitimacy of those officers. Because the ideal situation is that if you are a chief of staff in an office like that and you have a challenge, you go to your charge. Your charge is the head of public service. You don't even write to him. You pick up the phone because you have an extension to him and you ask the head of public service for a cup of coffee and you discuss those things internally. This new wave where everything is written and sent to social media, this propaganda is that we have a responsibility Mr. Chairman and I want to undertake to you as a public servant we have institutions, we inherited these institutions and we have a duty to hand over institutions to the next generations that are intact with the respect that they deserve. The respectability of security sector institutions is not going to be vulgarized and dragged through the mud because of sympathy addiction and all that kind of thing. Thank you sir. Right, okay. We we will then take uh, Honorable Honorable Mbai, you have already spoken. So we are going to the next people. There are people who have not asked questions. Honorable Rosa. Honorable Kaunya. Honorable Shuria. Thank you, Chair.
Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having been proactive, given that the matter we are discussing today has really been around and is causing a lot of tensions. I'd like to thank you for having been proactive. In the same breath, I'd like to also thank the CS for giving us such a detailed explanation. The reason why I'm thanking the, PS, the CS is because information is power. And what is happening today in this country, Mr. Chair, is that we are being governed by propaganda. When I look at the details that the CS has given, Chair, I feel sad. I'm saddened to know because what the country is being fed on is that the security detail that is in charge or is responsible for the security of the person of the deputy president has been tampered with, has been withdrawn, and therefore he's been left, and, uh, ex uh, he's been left exposed. When I look at the presentation that is before us, it is clear, and thank you, CS, for giving us this history. When you look at the history of the security detail in terms of the presidential escort unit for each of the former vice presidents of this country, it is clear that none of them had more than 14. All the former vice presidents had no more than 14 presidential escort units who were responsible for the security of the person of the vice president at that particular time. But the, it is clearly demonstrated here that the current holder of this office has 74 against 14 of all the former vice presidents. And this is why I'm saying that it is good that we have this information now so that the country can breathe and stop being governed by propaganda. When you compare the 74 to the 14, I will go further and look at the security in totality, where the current office holder has a total number of 257 or thereabout, either looking after security in his person and also security of his businesses or private businesses, 257 against the highest of 57 of the Honorable Raila Molodinga when he was the Prime Minister at that particular time. So we are comparing 257 with that highest of 57. The reason why I'm bringing up this comparison is just to quell out that propaganda so that Kenyans can actually see the reality that indeed one office has 257. This clearly brings me back to Animal Farm by George Orwell, where it says that indeed we are, or we are equal, but some people are more equal than others. And the demonstration here clearly shows that if you are a holder of the office of the deputy president, you are indeed more equal than any other Kenyan. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to request the CS at this particular point, because I know Kenyans are watching, Kenyans are anxious, Kenyans feel exposed and unprotected. Could you kindly, in a very gentle manner, also let us know that as much as we are discussing the security of the deputy president's office today, how exposed are these Kenyans? What is the ratio of this police security to the Kenyans? I would like to request for that. I would also, my second question, Chair, and I was quiet when everybody was talking, so I just request members to also give me that yes, opportunity. Yes, Honor, Honorable Peter Masara. You my you second spoken, question. You let Honorable Rosambu speak, and then you'll ask after that. And if there is a point of order. Yes, point of order. That, that is how we are conducting business. Yes. Please. My second question is I'd like to know from the CS in his office, is there a code of conduct that governs how you carry out your routine responsibility? For example, because everybody is asking, why now? Why now? And we've clearly seen that there was just a rearrangement. Rearrangement to me coming from a background of being a teacher of English language, does not mean withdrawal, it does not mean downgrading, it is rearrangement. So I would request the CS to kindly let us know, 
Is there a particular code of conduct which should govern your routine actions so that if you are withdrawing, if you are, if you are replacing uh, an AP called Otieno with one called Kipiegon or another one called Wafula, are you bound by a code of conduct which should govern you and make you talk to the officer or talk to the deputy president's office first before you replace Otieno with Kipiegon, with Wafula, or if there's an Asian, with uh, Yatin. I'd like to know if there's a special code of conduct, and if you actually didn't follow that code of conduct, then why? That should be the question, not why now. Because if it's routine, I imagine that you, are, you, you, you can carry out your routine activities. But I'd like to know, is there a code of conduct that governs your actions? Okay. When you have to... Done? Um, Chair, I hope you're going to you give have, us... You have done two questions. You have done two questions, and I don't want to be selfish by doing another one. Yes. But I hope you'll give us an opportunity to speak as Kenyans, uh, as leaders. Because, Chair, I think as leaders we must bear responsibility for this country. The people propagating and the people causing this propaganda and bringing the country into so much tension is nobody else but leaders. Right. But I hear, leaders I, on false information. I hear you. I hear you. So let, you, let's do it this way. We finish with the business here. Then uh, uh, you know what you can do as a politician, but uh, not in the committee. Yeah. Honorable, honorable Kaunya. Point of order, Chair. Before what is out of order? You. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, just one moment. Exactly. What is out of order? Chair, this is a house of record. Honorable, my sister, honorable, we have just mentioned that we are governed by propaganda. The right word is that. Other people want to guide by propaganda. We are being guided by the constitution. <laughs> the current government is governing. That's that's not, point, that's that's what I stopped yeah. that, uh, yeah, but what I correctly, what I said is seemingly yes. what the current okay. country you are going a teacher on of now English. is. I have two questions, uh, Chairman. Um, speaking with a background of having undertaken training for some of these officers that provide VVIP training and uh, the critical infrastructure and vital installation protection. Uh, Chairman, last year, uh, 2018, His Excellency the President, Uhuru Kenyatta, launched a police reform program that was meant to harmonize the command and control of officers in the field and this uh, i believe was implemented and my question is chairman my question to our cs is if indeed these reforms took place and in these reforms chairman you would recall that under the constitution the national police service is comprised of two units the kps and the aps the distinctive roles were clearly specified in this arrangement of the reform where the aps under dig uh, aps was to undertake that protection, critical infrastructure, the border, our borders under the border patrol units, and of course the protection of the VVIPs fell under that unit. And uh, the Kenya Police Service were to undertake other roles as specified. And uh, these roles, I believe, if that was implemented, and I think that's a question I want to ask the CS, then the question of all these rearrangements is actually chairman misplaced because the units that are supposed and they have been trained very well on protection of very important people, VVIPs and VIPs, at the gender service unit and the APS 
And Chairman, you recall just uh, a week, two weeks ago, Chairman, we were at Kanyonya Chairman, you recall, uh, where we have the Border Patrol Unit and the training. You witnessed the kind of training of the QRT, for example, the Quick Response Unit. It's one of the most well-trained units that actually is supposed to be guarding the president. Now, based on that reorganization, uh, CS, if you can clarify, even for the public, it would really help everybody to understand that aspect. The second question, uh, I believe that uh, our police officers are well professionally trained and they are doing a good job. Of course, they need to be funded in those uh, areas of shortcoming. But, Chairman, there is something that needs to be clarified by the CS. Whether there is a gap in law in terms of the numbers we deploy, uh, more particularly, Chairman, I want to give an example. In America, when Donald Trump was elected, to be president. He resigned from all the companies he was guarding. I think there's something not very, very clear about what the CS brought out, that uh, requests for guarding of even a butchery. <laughs> I think this question has paid a gap, and I think the CS, if you can clarify, then chairman I would propose as a committee, we come up with amendments to make sure some of those gaps are fixed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I thought you would start by saying you are previous commandant of which college? Chairman, I was uh, commandant of the AP Training College at Ambakasi, and uh, some of these officers who have been deployed to guard uh, is uh, the deputy president are some of the most well trained internationally not not local training they are trained internationally okay thank you so and i'm um, very very have uh, the confidence that uh, they, they they have what it takes to do the job thank you honorable um, sure thank you chair um, Mike, I have two questions for the CS. Uh, there was this famous gentleman by the name Kenei. Could he tell the committee, was this gentleman a GSU officer who worked at the DP's office? Was he a GSU officer or an administration police officer? Um, question number two. Uh, Tongi. I think he came here because he's from, is it Namira Map? No, 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 no. I, let, let me clarify. He is, uh, he is wanting to ask questions and I'm telling him I received no notice. So if you gave me no notice, you're not going to allow. Those are in the standing orders 195. Yeah, I have only one notice from the Honorable Okay, uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, question one was whether Kine was a GSU officer or an AP officer, and I think he worked at the DP's office. Question two, um, the CS did mention he cannot share the reasons as why the changes occurred because of operational reasons. Just, um, is the deputy president supposed to be made aware of the changes prior to the changes happening and the reasons why the changes were made? If so, was he briefed? prior to the changes being made. Thank you, Chair. That, that question has been asked, so uh, you can only may, maybe go over the answer again. Yeah. Now, Chairman. Oh, the Honorable, uh, bye. Because there are people who have not asked questions, and they are members of this committee, and they need to engage. So I'll, I'll allow your colleagues. Clarification, Chair, not a new question. Not clarification. Let the others finish. Be fair to them also. Uh, we want to take final round because uh, of time. So, uh, Honorable Sears, I want to take the remainder of the people so that then you can answer all of it together. Then we come to a close. Is that okay or is it too heavy? All right, okay. For those
those who haven't spoken. Uh, oh, yes, Honorable Tekla Tum, uh, who is uh, following us virtually, can you ask yes. a question now? Ask your question now. And, uh, and, and make it brief because of time. Eh? Yeah, I'll make it yes. Thank you. What does the constitution say about the security of the deputy president? Number two, was he informed when the officers are removed from his residence? Number three, uh, honorable chair, uh, research, uh, there was a research done and it has shown that Kenya is number four uh, of the people uh, who are having stress levels. Honorable Chair, we are one year or less with the elections, and uh, we have to take care of everything we are doing now, even in the security. I normally talk very well of our security apparatus, and I know the CS is very good in his job, at years today, the people who are doing the operations and uh, the transfer that uh, transfers are not abused to do things in the right way. Honorable Chair, as politicians, the deputy pre uh, president inclusive, have a following. And you cannot control the people in such scenarios. So, Honorable Chair, let's not take things easy. It is not as easy as that. As members of the security, when the security of all tenants and the top leadership includes, that is my contribution, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Dr. Tekla Tum. I can confirm that we have had all your questions and the CS has taken note. We will leave you and we'll keep you on so that you can get the answers when he starts the reply. Uh, Honorable Jeanette, sorry, it's not Honorable Jeanette, sorry for the remainder of the team, of um, the committee. Because the standing order say we shall first give the members of the committee, those who are interested, Honorable Kaluma, and then Honorable Vice Chair. Then in that order, after that, we'll go to Honorable Junet. I thank you, Chair, and I thank you, CS Chair. I traveled from Mumbai to Nairobi by road. Uh, last night, in fact, I arrived here, Chair, you remember, I, I communicated with you at 5 a.m. in the morning, believing that the deputy president was exposed. Chair, I'm saying this because from the statement I have here, I disturbed my person traveling by road of a person whose security detail is bigger than the entire security detail guarding Homer Bay County. <laughs> and I think I want to request that in as much as we play politics, we should not play politics with matter security. Chair, to put this matter in context, the deputy president in his usual manner says he has no problem with the security organization around him. But the politicians around him are saying there is a downgrade and undue exposure. And on this, based on that of his chair, is occasioning unnecessary anxiety in public mind. So, so chair, my first question or request is that the people around the deputy, some are not just politicians, CS. And in as much as you are saying you should not be bothered by the letter which came from the chief of staff of the deputy president, the public concern about this matter commenced from that letter. Yeah, I saw it on Twitter and I asked what was happening. But I was asking why didn't the deputy president's chief of staff, knowing the security channels and arrangements, you know, speak with them in a manner that protects the integrity and the professionalism of our security apparatus. So that, Chair, I will be seeking your directions at the end. That in as much as the CS and his team say they are not politicians, they want to do their work and leave it at that, the matter of the conduct of that chief 
of staff in the office of the deputy president, being an employee under our charge as parliament is a matter that must be dealt with. So that I'm confirming that after this, if it does not come from the committee on its own motion, I'll bring it before the committee so that it can come here and tell us the code of conduct under which he operates when he writes and posts things in the social media in the manner he's doing. But see, yes, this matter has been uh, taken as a discount course outside there because the members of the public and the media, which is our main channel of communication, do not take time to understand the law beginning with the Constitution. In fact, CS, I'm shocked at the manner and the extent to which our very competent officers in the administration police service have been undermined. And you hear people comparing our APs to even G4S. I think we don't understand what the administration police service is and the Kenya police are. So I would have requested that because the media is here and Kenyans are watching, you have elaborated not only provisions of the standing order, I think for the sake of the public, you would have you know, made a few mentions of it now that the media is uh, showing these proceedings. And more particularly, Chair, the units which have been created under both Kenya Police Service and Administration Police Service and what they are in charge of. Because you see, Chair, people have been saying the Deputy President is not being protected. As in the committee, no. That the Presidential Escort Unit, which is a unit affiliated to the General Service Unit, is protecting the person of the Deputy President as they do that of the President. You are being told that a change in terms of the officers guarding the residents was a downgrade. What the CS needs to tell the public is when this security of government buildings protection unit was established and its mandate, that people you know, can understand that there is a unit specific to protection of those critical installations, the government buildings like the deputy's residence. But lastly, yes, if you look at uh, the statement at page two, you are clarifying who the GSU guards at paragraph nine. It's the president, the deputy president, the state houses and state lodges. So that the forum of this committee, which is the link of the security apparatus with parliament, chair should be utilized by the CS to tell Kenyans that if anybody who wants the residents of the deputy president to be included in this category. And what they should be proposing is the inclusion. But before the inclusion, really, you cannot obligate the IG to install GSU to guard a residence, not mentioned as a, a residence is obligated to, 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 to take care of. So, so I would request, uh, Chair, that uh, the CS makes a bit of these mentions for clarity because we are live. Mention the various units. I imagine, Chair, that even the Border Patrol Unit, the anti stock theft Unit, even this yes, you clarify to Kenyans whether they are under Kenya Police or Administration Police so that people can understand these things. And, 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 and to me, that, 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 that would be good in terms of... Uh, explaining and what are these units and their formations and their roles. But, but Chair, I, I regret we have taken too long playing politics over an office that is protected more than my county. And, and, and that is the, 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 the aspect that surrounds me. Honorable Chair. Chair, let me also join the colleagues in thanking the CS for really telling us the truth and also telling the Kenyans the truth. Uh, matter security chair is something that you cannot compromise as the committee, as the members of this committee. And
why. Maybe he does it. He didn't want Kenyans to know the truth. And thank you, CS. Now we know the truth. Just here, I've done a small um, calculation on police population ratio to the citizens. And I found out it's one to 600. One to 600. One person has 257 officers here, meaning 254,200 Kenyans are exposed. And this is a person who calls himself a hustler. What happened, President, to the IG? All these officers who allocated him, was it your predecessor IG or it is you? If it is your predecessor who did this, then I understand you want to now uh, do rearrangement or change things. So maybe you can tell us, or is it your predecessor who did this mess, or it is you that you want to come and correct uh, this uh, mess. Lastly, my chair, uh, chair to CS, we have been seeing politicians who have been faking arrest stores to blame the security so that they can have sympathy inside uh, Kenyans uh, so that they can be seen like they are the lesser or they are being treated unfairly. And it, uh, it happened many times and we have not seen any arrest to the politicians or any person who has been faking or spreading propaganda. So we want you to proceed and do arrest. If you could have done these things before, maybe today these things we could not have been discussing this. So we want you to do your work. Nobody should intimidate you. This committee is the committee that oversight your ministry. Kindly do your job, do what is right, so that Kenyans can have hope. And that is what we want to see. Thank you, Chair. Which question was not answered? Uh, Chair, I've just... Your realized, question? It is a question of mine that wasn't answered, that I would hope that he's, he's going to answer as Which answer. is? That when you're discussing matter security with the office of the Deputy President, who should we listen to? Should we listen to the Deputy President? Should we listen to the Chief of Staff? Or should we listen to his allies? So that we, we are able to know, yeah. when we have an official complaint, who should we listen to? Because if we have one situation where the Deputy President says he's okay, then his allies say he's not, then the Chief of Staff says he's not, who, as a committee, yeah. should we be listening to? Thank you. I think that's fairly straightforward. Honorable Jeanette. Chair, I was to get yeah, that. Chair, so much, Chair. Chair, I'm here. Honorable, yeah. honorable, honorable, yeah. honorable yeah. Just one, let me finish that round. I'll give you that clarification. But I hope it's not another question you're asking. All right. Okay. Chair, thank you, Chair. Chair, in accordance with the standing orders of Parliament, I wrote a letter to you yesterday requesting to attend the committee as a friend of the committee. And I want to thank you for accepting my request. That's what the standing order says, that you write to the chair of the committee. Initially, first I, mis I misunderstood. I wrote to the speaker, but I retrieved it. I wrote back to you. <laughs> Having said, Chair, I have just one or two questions, Chair. First, Chair, according to the document provided by the minister, and, and you see, Chair, government is run through traditions and precedents. And the previous traditions and precedents, Mr. Chair, have shown that the former holders of the office of the Vice President or Deputy President had very few numbers of policemen or women, 22, 24, 12. We are dealing with a case of 257 here, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, 257, Chair. Chair, where I come from in my constituency, they are, the last census, the population was 204,000 people. And the number of police officers who are there are not more than 80, 70, 80 in my constituency. When I divided that by this 204, one police officer is guarding 3,300 people in a day, especially the night is worse. One policeman is guarding in my constituency 3,300 people, Mr. Chair. And here we are discussing 257. My question actually is not about the law now, because we have all agreed there is no law that guides how to assign a policeman to VIPs. But it's a question of morality. I want to ask the minister in charge of security.
whether this is moral to give one person 257 and people in my constituency have only 80 police officers with a very junk old police vehicle <laughs> which you have to push at the night when it wants to wake up. <laughs> Secondly, Mr. Chair, I, was, uh, I saw the minister the other time revamping the private sector security, the so-called private sector, G4S and other names. And why I thought he was revamping that private security so that they can guard private enterprises properly, so that they are regulated and private enterprises are safe. Now, when the minister and, and the IG are deploying policemen to private premises, what will the G4S do? What will these private firms do? Because that is their work. You have taken policemen to butcheries, to guard butcheries. <laughs> sure. What will this? We have over 100,000 employees in the private sector, in the private, uh, you know, these private uh, security firms. What will those officers do if you're deploying to every hotel, every butchery, uh, a farm in uh, Taitata Veta, 2,500 acres of land with cows, you're deploying policemen there, hotels, policemen, everywhere policemen? What will these private citizens, what will they, what will they get, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair? So I want to ask him, how moral is that also? My question is based, laws are made to guide morality. Let's leave laws and law alone. Let's now go to the morals of our, our society whether it is moral to, to deploy a policeman to guard your private enterprises, when we have over 100,000 Kenyans who are employed to do the Kazia private security. Lastly, Chair, lastly, Chair, Chair, it's very surprising that we have Kenyans who are not politically, you know, theft everywhere, and then you can deploy 257 mem members, or, I mean security members, Kuchunga, shamba ya, ya, ya kuku, shamba ya samati, eh? nyumba ya mopango ya kando, klande, chair, I'm done. I don't want to ask another question. No, no, the minister no, no. must apologize to Kenya, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair, why that happened? Honestly, he must apologize. Leave alone removing or deploying. He must tender an apology to Kenya that it will not happen again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what are you clarifying, Honorable Bombay? Thank you, Chair. The reason I've been very persistent is, uh, Chair, I've served as an administrative police officer for 14 years, and it pains me when I see the deployment of police, administrative police officers being termed as a downgrade. It can't be. These are officers who are highly trained. My concern is, we know in the rearrangement, and especially the current uh, president or the deputy president, uh, uh, GSU officers, were moved and the uh, police officers from uh, actually the right unit which is supposed to guard the deputy president's residence were deployed. What we never came out clear is about the numbers because uh, I asked how many GSU officers were moved and how many administration police officers from the SGB were deployed. Yeah, yeah, I remember, yes. Thank you. That's it's also straightforward, Honorable CS. I'll allow you then to have a go at the answers. Then at the tail end, sure. we will ask you to uh, to do the remarks after we have listened to the answers. And remember, there are questions that you are not tackled by Honorable Ambugus. That one from Honorable Mbai. You are also in the process. Answer them. Even I'm here. Thank you. Order. Order, Honorable Robin. Robin. Yes. I've been raising my hand. You raise your hand, but uh, you don't belong to this committee. And I, and I hope you are not come to create a drama. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, we, we have standing orders. And the standing orders dictate, Honorable Mbai, that you write to the chair 24 hours before. Chairman, I notified you yesterday. Listen to me. You write to the chair 24 hours before and even indicate the subject matter you want to address. So you, we have done well to allow you to listen. That is good enough. <laughs> Chairman, I wanted to Beyond that, to if, if you then proceed to disrupt this committee, I'm not we, will, we will follow the standing orders. I'll, I'm not disrupting. Okay. So you listen to what is going on. And allow me take, to take your call. This committee chair. Honorable Robbie, please. Honorable Robbie. 
Honor Borobi, I'll read to the standing orders now. You but must you be able to. You must... I notified you yesterday. Can you bring a copy of that letter? Do you have a letter? It's all right. You have a letter. You want to cause drama so that Kenyans Not can see? Drama, yes, then bring the letter. I'm a strict law of processes. Okay. Honorable <laughs> Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. I, I will do my best to go over all, all the questions. I we, we try to take as meticulous notes to my, my peers and I so that we don't forget anything. Um, Honorable Rosa, who you asked the question of the, the, population, the police to population ratio, at the, at the current is 1 to 600. The UN uh, standard is 1 to 450. We, we, we are working hard to get to uh, uh, at least to the UN uh, level standards. The truth of the matter is this, uh, honorable members, as you know, we, have, we didn't recruit for about two years because of budget issues and because also we wanted to uh, step up the equipment and acquisitions for our security sector so that we are at par with some of the challenges that we are facing right now. Now that we have uh, resumed again the recruitment, we will be working hard uh, subject to budget allowing to ensure that we move fast enough to uh, meeting uh, the standards. And I know that you, you asked the question in the context of the deployment that we now uh, have explained that we have done with the Office of the Deputy President. Uh, I understand, and, and I think this issue has come up again and again. We, we Mr. Chairman and Honorable Members, we learn through experiences. Now all of us as a country are learning. Because this is intertwined with the question that was asked by another member of parliament. I think it's Honorable Kaluma who said, what happens to, no, it's Honorable Aogu uh, Kaunya who talked about businesses and public office. Uh, because the expectation is that when you are in, in public office, you're supposed to walk away from private sector responsibilities so that then the two issues don't uh, clash, such as cases we're having now we're having to deal with. It tells us one thing, honorable members, there's some work that we still need to do. There's some work we need to do in terms of tightening the law, there's some work we need to do in terms of uh, you know, looking at chapter 6 and uh, tightening our responsibilities, because quite clearly there the, 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 the is an overlap or, or the clash between business and, uh, and, and, and public office sometimes can cause challenges such as we are dealing with. But again, on this particular score, I plead for my colleagues, the heads of the security agencies. You know, if you are the Inspector General and you receive a request of this kind, it becomes very difficult to, to, to say no. We have been riding on this, as I say, unregulated question on the numbers and the extent of deployment. And now is the time for us to look at it again and come up with a statutory action that will now regulate the numbers and say, for example, even if you have VVIP, the ratios uh, of uh, the officers deployed uh, to you will not exceed this number, as it were. Otherwise, if we leave it open as it is now, and no one knows this better than Honorable Okaunya because he was in this sector before he faced this same issues before. If we leave it open like that, these issues will keep recurring. And you can see clearly the propensity to abuse this is real. Uh, you know, it, it, it can be abused. For example, in 2018, we all agreed at the National Security Council that we are surrendering prison warders from protection duties because, you know, uh, when we looked at the ratio of prison warders to uh, inmates, it became clear that we have enough numbers in the APS, in the SGB, and the new commando units we are creating to provide VIP protection. So let us all return, uh, you know, uh, officers from the prison service uh, to do their, their correctional service work. But you can see still, even in the condition that is uh, uh, guarding the office of the deputy president, we have uh, about 13 officers from the, the prison service. So unless there is a strict and stringent regulation and enactment of the same, and then we enforce it, all of us, so that it applies across the board, we'll keep in, you know, encountering these challenges as, as, as we go along. Is there a special code of conduct on how... to uh, handle these changes and deployments when they come? The answer is actually no, uh, as uh, you know, Honorable Bu, you asked. Because as I said, 
Uh, we cannot second guess the Inspector General of our National Police Service. He, he takes decisions on our behalf throughout. He takes decisions on the 24-hour cycle and information to make certain decisions. So we cannot require him that uh, if I want an officer from my ethnic community, at, um, you must write to me and then I get the letter and so on. There's no security system that operates that way around the world. You know, we are becoming more and more a modern the state. So in respect, therefore, I'm saying, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there is no code of conduct that was violated in, in, in this case, in terms of the changes of government. Nothing was violated. And in fact, there's a question I don't want to ask now because it can steer us off to another debate. How is it that these questions are being asked now when we have done this rearrangement several times before, even in that office? How come that these issues are coming up now? And we've done so many of those rearrangements before in many other VVIP offices, including that one. So, so the question is, it's because we are within a political context and, and, and uh, you know, straightforward professional departmental actions are being unnecessarily politicized and being subjected to you know, you know, emotional and irrelevant politics. Unfortunately, to the detriment of uh, the stability of, of, of the country, but I think on a balance of probabilities going forward after the clarifications we have made today, we are all going to be aligned on this because facts are as they are, things are clear to everybody. There is no downgrade of anything here. We know we are doing what we must do, and we are continuing. But I, I cannot uh, plead with you enough as a committee that we need statutory action on these issues of ratios, even for VVIPs and numbers and so on. Otherwise, you know, you are going to force police officers to open an OB for chicken. You know, you are putting police officers to guard a, a, a poultry farm, so they will not be running an OB there for chicken. This chicken arrived at this time, there, this time, you know, and so on. It's a joke in the long run. We, we are not, uh, you know, uh, going to be organized in that kind of manner. Honorable Kukawunya asked the question about uh, um, police reforms and the unified command. It's the question of the unified command. As you know, and, and, and Mr. Chairman, indulge me to say this. This is more or less like a personal comment that every time you listen to somebody like uh, uh, Honorable Kukawunya speak, you feel the pleasure of a knowledgeable person, because he's speaking from a position of knowledge. If people were debating these issues from that kind of position, we wouldn't even be having this kind of hula baloo around the country. It's because, you see, the, 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 the quest for unified command was intended to make police effective, efficient in the delivery of service, but also, again, to grow our capacities to deal with our dynamic challenges in the security sector. That is why, for example, uh, when we came up with an all-women commando team, uh, you know, that, that is now making headlines and doing us great stuff is because we wanted to have this integrated, prepared because there are circumstances where we need to deploy special units of that kind as it were. The unified command is a journey, Honorable Kaunya. It is not going to happen in one year or two years or three years. Even we internally are having a debate because since 2018, when His Excellency the President directed this and began this phase of working on a unified command, we worked on this for about uh, three years. And sometimes we step back and ask ourselves the question, is it working well for us? For example, how does it relate to Ngao? And how does it relate to deployment? Is it interfering with what we are doing? The questions abound. But we are just about to begin reviewing you know, the implementation of this for the last three years. I know issues will come up or some things we need to change, as it were. But it is a journey, it's something we are working towards. But now, and I think that is what you are referring to, because of that unified command, it is much easier to integrate the various units and various formations to get them to focus on a task at one time. If we have a challenge, for example, at a particular border point, we actually can pull together, for example, uh, as to uh, QRT, border patrol, uh, you know, and the GSU, even if it's a uh, contingent of, uh, you know, uh, the G company, and deliver on the assignments that we have. That's exactly what we're doing right now in, in, in Laikipia, where we are forcing a challenge. And our GSU commandant was briefing us this morning about, you know, his approach. And you can see clearly that because of that unified command approach, we are moving more towards being much more effective in terms of responding to uh, the present challenges that we deal with. But it's a journey, and because you are our committee, when we do the assessment and the evaluation of what you have done, we'll bring the report to you, and we'll discuss it with you, and many of you who come from this background will have an opportunity to comment about what we need to do more, and what we need to do better to, to strengthen ourselves as it were. 
Is there a gap in the law in terms of uh, uh, business and uh, public officers? There are the CS. And as I've said, you, you, you can see the conflict that we are dealing with. It's apparent. It was spoken to very strongly by uh, Honorable uh, Rosa Buyu and the Honorable Kawinya. It's some of the reasons why we are facing the challenges. Uh, Honorable the late uh, Sergeant uh, Kenei came from AP and he was part of the staff. Uh, 40 strong personnel uh, from the AP at the uh, Arambe House Annex, which is the office of the Deputy President. I think that's the direct answer, and, and the, that is it. Was the DP made aware? This was asked by uh, Honorable Tekla, and I think I answered this question earlier, Mr. Chairman. You know, there, there's a distinction. There's a, what you may call a fundamental change, and there's what is routine and quasi routine. Just imagine if every day you are reorganizing, you are doing deployment. I gave you a classic example. Forget about the person of the DP and someone who occupies the office of the DP. Just let's take, you know, a routine of like a regional commissioner. If every time you are doing rearrangement, the inspector general is doing rearrangement of the police command in Nairobi, he has to keep writing and so on. I mean, it's unnecessarily laborious, as it were, because all of us work in this context and all the actors who are supposed to be there know what needs to happen. There was nothing major that was being done here. And as I said clearly, if we weren't in this political context where we are, no one would even be talking about it. And, the, and, and actually, some of this rearrangement has been done before, even in that office. But it has not raised this kind of rule of law and so on. It's just because of the political environment in which we are. And now, you know, anything goes, uh, as it were. We, even if it is a simple, simple straightforward action, it becomes it's held hostage by the politics of the day. And then now, people go to town, become the subject of funeral speeches and judge speeches and so on and so forth. I, I honestly don't think that, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, that, that kind of thing. About uh, the Honorable Tech class, about the Constitution and the security of the Deputy President, uh, I think I've asked this question several times. By law and by tradition, His Excellency the Deputy President is guided by the Presidential Escort Unit, with a special team that uh, you know is set aside for that particular purpose. Uh, does the current order of jobs have that? I answered that, and I've actually provided the statistics and the figures about uh, who is there. About the followers' stress, you know, Honorable Tekla uh, was asking about people are stressed, and the uh, followers are getting stressed. Well, followers get stressed because their leader is stressed. Eh? The same as that. But because the, 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 the followers, uh, you know, get stressed because their leaders stress them. Because you wake up in the morning and what you're drumming to people is uh, things like this, basically lying to people. You know, if you wake up every day, your, your business is to lie to people, tell them things that do not exist. You know, lie every day. And you, can, you have seen that, you are all here. You have seen that in this country where, you know, Maybe you can almost conclude that some people's career is about lying. You know, they will never tell anything truthful. You wake up in the morning and misinterpret things and talk about things that have not happened anywhere. Oh, we are being finished. That's why I said the politics of sympathy addiction. You know, you, everything is about sympathy. You know, I'm, sympathize with me. I'm, I'm dying. I'm being finished. The government is switching off the sun and the moon and so on. <laughs> you know, if you live that way, then, then you stress your followers. The, the, the stress of your, your followers it's coming from the stress of the leaders. If, if, if leaders were honest with people, addressed issues honestly, and, 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 and are dealt with matter, why would the followers be stressed? The followers are stressed because of their leaders. That is my view, and, and, and that's what I would tell Honorable uh, uh, Tekla, that let people address the issues in a dispassionate manner, in a, in a very clear and objective manner, and there will be uh, no issue about it. Um, Honorable Ngunjiri is worried, so who do we trust when it comes to issues of security and so on? I, I would like to reiterate this position, which, which has been made clear by many, many, many people, many greater people and greater minds than myself and my colleagues before you this morning. But you know, we, we are leaders for a season. We have been given an opportunity to make a contribution to our country for a season. We are not going to be here forever. I am, I think, the 12th or 13th Minister of Interior. There will be a 14th, a 15th, and an even 64th Minister of Interior in Kenya. While we have the opportunity, we do what is right for our people and what is right for, for, for the country. And, and formal communications and formal channels of engagement are clear to everybody that we address each other with a measure of respect. But Mr. Chairman, let me say this, and this was spoken to very eloquently by Honorable Kaluma. 
Nothing will sustain us than protecting institutions that have been created by the Constitution and by the law. And institutions are bigger than all of us. But you see, if you get engaged in subverting institutions and undermining institutions from time to time, it becomes a challenge, uh, as, as it were. So who do we believe? We will believe formal, proper, truthful, factual communication from an office. That's what we will believe. And there are, there are, there are structures. This is a, a government that is about over six decades old. We have found a tradition. This country has been managed by people since 1963 to this day, and they have established traditions of engagement and how you conduct government business. If you have a challenge, you go to your supervisors and discuss it with them. You don't write letters you know, using street language and then you put it in social media and then you know you engage in cheap populism, throwing an irrelevant tantrum in the hope of gaining sympathy. Just, you're, you're basically playing for sympathy and not, not, not caring about the country as, 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 as it were. So, Honorable Mujiri, who do we believe? We believe formal, factual, truthful communication that respects the structures of government, knowing as we do and as we must at all times that we are only individuals. We are here today, tomorrow we are gone. And then we must hand over to the generations that come after us, the institutions that we uh, that were handed to us. Uh, uh, Honorable um, uh, Junet asked the question, is it moral, the situation that we have right now? I, I think as a honest public servant, I would be pretending if I didn't honestly say, I also don't think it's moral, what we have right now. I am as chastised as everyone else is on this particular matter. And I agree, and the, my colleagues at the Ministry of Interior and all the heads of the agencies will work with you, honorable members, to look at the law and see how we rectify this situation, so that it may not be abused as we go into the future. Because where there are no regulations, where there are no good controls, uh, the propensity for abuse is huge. And then none of us is whole enough not to be tempted to abuse uh, you know, discretion if that discretion is not controlled or discretion is not guided. And, and then, you know, and, and a situation emerges where you abuse discretion, then you turn around after you abuse discretion and claim sympathy, you know, and so on. So, so in, in this particular case, because the human beings are human beings, and we are all human beings, and we can make mistakes, where challenges of this kind exist is where we, as the executive branch of government, reporting to you as the people of Kenya's representatives, we need to work with you to see how we can overcome these kinds of challenge through a, a statutory action as, as, as it were. And uh, I think uh, uh, finally, we, uh, I'm grateful you allow me, Mr. Chairman, to make my final comment. Uh, the Honorable